Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the 2024 edition of Tax Update, getting ready for tax season. Um, if you need closed captions, uh, you can click on the show captions button. That should be on the menu at the bottom of the Zoom window. There's a small CC icon. Click there and live captions should be displayed. Um, the San Francisco Public Library acknowledges that we occupy the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramaytush Ohlone peoples, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. We recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. As uninvited guests, we affirm their sovereign rights as First Peoples and wish to pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramaytush community. We recognize to respectfully honor Ramatush peoples, we must embrace and collaborate meaningfully to record indigenous knowledge and in how we care for San Francisco and all its people. So please come visit us in person at the library, at the main library. We're on the fourth floor. Um, come on up, um, we're happy to help you. If you cannot visit us in person, you're welcome to contact us through our chat reference service, which can be found on our webpage, it's sfpl.org. You can also email us at bizsitech at sfpl.org. That is B-U-S-S-C-I-T-E-C-H at sfpl.org. Or you can give us a call at 415-557-4488. Um, you can find out more about all the business and finance resources that we offer on our webpage at sfpl.org. Click on the Research and Learn tab and then click on the Business and Finance Resources link. If you've missed any of our programs, you can view programs that we've received permission to record on SFPL's YouTube channel. Go to playlists and scroll down to the Work It playlist. There you'll be able to watch all the past programs that we have recorded. Also, after today's program, you will all receive an email with a copy of the presentation slides and a link to the recording. I'd also like to mention, if you're looking for more valuable information about taxes, please join us for a pair of upcoming programs that will be a great complement to today's presentation. On February 13th from 12 to 1 p.m., we'll be offering the presentation, Taxes, How to Stay Out of Trouble. And then on Thursday, March 14th, from 6 to 7 p.m., we'll be hosting Tax Trouble, What to Do If You've Got Problems with the IRS. Both of these programs will be presented by Heather Liston. Um, I encourage everyone to register for both of these great programs. Um, links to more information about these programs and how to register will be provided in the chat. Um, now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome um, SFPL's Business Science and Technology Center's favorite, uh, Larry Pond. Larry, you want to take over the screen? All right, Jonathan. Well, thank you. And hello, everybody. And good afternoon. So it's a uh, new tax season upon us. So give me a second here to uh, set up my screen for you. So give me a minute here. Make sure I got this going. And if you have any questions or comments, you're welcome to, them, welcome to enter in the chat. Most likely, I will not be addressing those issues during the presentation because we got a lot to go over today. But I have reserved time at the end, and I'll stick around as long as it takes to answer your questions. And if um, if, if there's an urgent question or something, uh, I might I might be addressing it during the uh, presentation. So we're here until. Um, 3.30 in the afternoon. So um, so let's get started. So it's the 2024 tax season here. And let me just get the slides moving along. So a little bit about me. I'm a CPA and uh, enrolled agent and United States tax court practitioner. So those are my tax credentials. I'm also a personal financial specialist, a certified financial planner and an accredited estate planner. And so those are my financial planning credentials, and I'm located in Redwood Shores, California. 
I, I was born in San Francisco, so that's uh, that's where I started my life. But I've been a tax professional since 1986, and um, <clears throat> I'm a national tax speaker, and I also teach income tax here at the College of San Mateo. I'm actually broadcasting from room building 14 of the College of San Mateo. So that's where I am right now. There's a, a whiteboard right behind me. <clears throat> but if you want to learn more about taxes, you can take a look at the courses that I teach and other instructors teach on income taxes. I teach the individual tax course. In the summer, I'll be teaching the trust gift and estate course. And in the fall, I'll be teaching income tax and also the enrolled agent exam review course. So if you have friends or colleagues who um, need to take those courses, um, they're, they're available. And I teach it on Zoom, so you don't have to come here to San Mateo. It'll be taught over Zoom, and anyone in California can take the courses. So let's get started here on what we're going to talk about. So what we're going to talk about today is let's talk about some late-breaking news to get you up to date on what's going on in the tax world. Then we'll go over the tax forms, uh, an update on the forms and what's going on in there. And we'll close with what can you still do to reduce your 2023 taxes? Even though 2023 is already closed, we're in 2024. So well, those are the, the big three topics we're, we're talking about here. So number one, is that last Friday, President Biden signed legislation that averting a government shutdown. Because if he didn't pass a spending bill last week, we would have had a government shutdown. And that's very, very frustrating. And as you know, government shutdowns do not save us any money. It actually costs us more money, but it causes a lot of headaches. And especially for us tax people, because that, that kind of... Uh, um, they lay off two thirds of the IRS employees and, and they're trying to gear up for tax season. So that's not a good time to have a government shutdown. So on Friday the 19th, Governor Biden signed the law, but it's only a stop, stop, gap, um, stop gap legislation. So um, John's got a comment here, no auto. Can everybody hear me okay? If, if, if Just let me know. John, then can you let me know you hear me okay? If, if you can hear me, that's fine. And uh, technical issues, Jonathan? Or... Um, I can hear you. Okay. Um... If there's technical issues, Jonathan will help you. <laughs> All right. So so the stopgap legislation basically extends the 2022 spending plans levels. And our next drama is going to be March the 1st and March the 8th, if, if, if our Congress doesn't get anything done. So that means that's the deadline for 12 spending bills uh, to fund the government. And the big ones are like the defense bill, the foreign bill, uh, aid to Israel, aid to Ukraine, um, the border problems, and all those kind of things. It's it's a big, big, big deal. 12 huge bills. It's, a, it's um, you know, it's billions of dollars here. So in the House, it passed uh, 314 to 108. So 106 Republicans said no, and two Democrats said no. In the Senate, it was a little more bipartisan, 77 to 18. So stay tuned in the next coming weeks on what our wonderful Congress is going to do. Well, just give you an update on what's going on is in 2023, we did not have a tax bill. Because uh, as you've been observing, Congress has been quite dysfunctional. They just can't get their act together. For a while, time for a while there, we didn't even have a Speaker of the House. I mean, come on, how how bad can that be? First time in history. So for 2024, we have a tax bill. It's called the Tax Relief for American Families and Workers Act of 2024. The bill number is HR 7024, and it was passed 40 to three out of the House Ways and Means Committee. And you know, Congress is. Uh, you know, they always like doing acronyms. So the acronym would this be um, TRAFA, <laughs> Tax Relief for American Families and Workers Act. So it was a bipartisan bill. The um, On the House side, the House Ways and, Committee, Ways and Means Committee is the committee that writes the tax laws. And it's run by Republican uh, Mr. Smith. And he's the head of the Ways and Means Committee. It passed 40 to 3. So that's pretty, 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 pretty darn unanimous. 
pretty close to being unanimous. On the Senate, it's run by Senator Ron Wyden, who's a Democrat. So they came to an agreement. We have a bipartisan agreement here. Now, stay tuned in the news because the House vote could be uh, next week. So stay tuned. Let's see what happens. Let's cross our fingers and hope Congress uh, actually does any work. So let's talk about what this bill can do if it passes. Number one is increases the maximal refundable child tax credit. So currently it's $1,600, but it'll be increased to $1,800 for 2023, 1924, 2025, and also increase the child tax credit uh, with inflation. It's been the same number for the last few years. It's been $2,000 as the child tax credit, also known as the CTC. So what does this mean? Well, since we know there could be a retroactive change to 2023, I frankly wouldn't rush into doing your tax return until we know what Congress is going to do about this. Because you can get your tax return done now, but then you might have to change it again. Uh, the IRS has assured us they will automatically make this correction, but I frankly don't trust them. The other changes, those are on the uh, individual side. There's a lot of changes. This is an 82-page bill, so I'm not going to go over every detail, but I'm pointing out the big ones. Uh, also increase Section 179 expensing. Those are for uh, businesses to be able to write off the equipment that they purchased. Also, there's been some tax changes that have been made back in 2017 that took into effect in 2022 and 2023. One of them was what's called bonus depreciation. So in 2022, we had a 100% bonus depreciation if you bought equipment for your business. In 23, it's down to 80%. And, and in 2024, it's 60%. It keeps going down until it's zero. The other thing is, uh, something called Section 174, that's for research and experimental expenses. And we're here in Silicon Valley. That's a big deduction for many, many businesses here. I mean, we got the biotech companies, we have the tech companies, we have all kinds of innovative businesses we have here. And what the law uh, changed starting in 2022 was you couldn't write off all those expenses. You had to amortize them, which means you 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 deduct them over five years or 15 years. Five years if it's um, you know, domestic, 15 years if the research was done overseas. So the proposal here is to push these, these uh, provisions to 2026. So if you notice, 2022, um, that's a retroactive change. So if you already filed your tax return for 2022, and you qualify for this deduction, you can amend your 2022 return to get a refund. So you say, hey, that's great. How are we going to pay for it? Well, Congress has thought of a way to pay for it by, um, oops, wrong way, uh, by uh, stopping uh, ERC, Employee Retention Credit. You probably heard those commercials on the radio, seen the ads on TV. Um, some of you even might have gotten phone calls, texts, and all that. So unfortunately, many of those are probably fraudulent. Many of those are uh, being applied for people by, by companies or businesses that don't even qualify. So what one way to pay for these tax breaks is to stop new uh, employee retention credit claims. Um, they're going to close it off on January 31st. That's next week. Also, all those people you hear doing those commercials, you've seen those commercials. Well, they want to impose substantial penalties on them, uh, $200,000 or 75% of their income. So because, I mean, the, 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 there's billions of dollars of these claims, and the IRS is really busy auditing right now. So anyway, the other thing is to give the IRS more time to audit them. Uh, instead of the five years that they got, they're going to get six years to audit these type of claims. All right, so that's what's going on with this tax bill. Stay tuned, we'll see what happens. Okay, oh, the other change is uh, if you get a Form 1099 NEC or 1099 miscellaneous, the threshold's been $600 for decades. So they're gonna increase that to $1,000. So you have to, you know, if you're if you're a gig worker, you're an independent contractor, uh, 
uh, you'll get a 1099 if you if you earn more than $1,000 from them instead of $600. And also starting in 24, it'll be indexed for inflation. Here's the URL if you want to read the, this bill. It's 82 pages. And, um, you know, so, so the next step is that it's past the committee. Now it goes to the full House of Representatives. There's 434 of them. Not 435 because they kicked out George Santos, so his seat is empty. So it's 435 for Congress members. And I think we have 100 senators. Uh, no, or, or is it we have, no, we don't have 100 senators. We have 99 because we lost our dear, no, we have a uh, we have an interim senator for Dianne Feinstein. So I, I think we might have 100 senators to vote. So in the next few weeks, we'll see what happens with the debates and the votes and see if they get anything done. So stay tuned. Um, news from Washington about this tax break. Okay, what else is late breaking? Well, uh, right before Christmas, the IRS gave us a Christmas present. So on December 19th, the IRS announced that they're giving penalty relief for 2020 and 2021. So if you owe taxes on your 2020 and 2021 tax returns, the IRS will waive the failure to pay penalties. And it's going to be automatic. And what happened was because of the pandemic, because the IRS is just overwhelmed right now, they're way behind in processing paperwork, <clears throat> that they're going to kind of lighten their load by, by, by giving this relief. However, to qualify for it, uh, your liability has to be less than $100,000. And the, the balance due notices were between February 5th of 2022 and December 7th of 2023. They've also warned to us that starting April 1st of this year, the failure to pay penalty will resume. It'll, it'll start uh, start being due starting April 1st of 2024. So, so just give you a reminder here about this uh, about this penalty, uh, penalty relief. It's automatic. You don't really have to do anything with it. But I'd recommend uh, checking carefully. If you're working with a tax professional, uh, they can help you by reviewing your transcripts and double checking the calculations. Uh, just give you a reminder, if you owe back taxes to the IRS, the interest rate is now 8%. Yeah, just a couple of years ago, it was, it was only 3%. But because of the high interest rates um, we've been having, it's now 8%. That's what you owe on your back taxes or if you don't pay your taxes on time, for example, for this year, for 2023, taxes are due on April 15th. If you don't pay by April 15th, uh, the interest is at 8% after April 15th of this year for your 2023 taxes. So the penalty is half a percent per month, up to a maximum of 25%. If you negotiate a payment plan with the IRS, uh, it gets reduced to a quarter of a percent, 0.25%. Now, if you owe more than $59,000, the IRS could file a lien. And what that means is it could show up on your credit report if you owe more than $59,000. Also, um, you can have your passport revoked. And I've, I've heard of people who showed up at the airport. Uh, they, they, they scanned their passport and er, you can't leave the country. So uh, if you owe more than $59,000, that could be the case. However, to get your passport um, reinstated, you can you can uh, negotiate an installment plan with the IRS, a payment plan, um, and then they'll reinstate your your passport. So this is how they're controlling it. They, they're not letting people leave the country if you owe back taxes. Last summer, the, the IRS announced that they're no longer uh, visiting your your work or your house. The revenue office. Sirs, we're, we're, we're not going to visit you anymore. And it was because they were concerned about safety. Uh, people, they were being shot at or being abused or being, being, being assaulted. So the, the, the IRS uh, decided that for the safety of our employees, we're not going to make visits. However, if you owe more than $250,000, you will be assigned your very own revenue officer. Those are the collections people with the IRS, and they will visit you. They'll visit you at your house, they'll visit you at your work, they'll visit you at your friends, your girlfriends, your mistress, and everybody that they can find. They will come looking for you. So take this very seriously. So just a quick review of the letters that the IRS sends. So open your letters 
when you get get here from the IRS, the IRS will only send letters. They're not going to text you. They're not going to email you. They're not going to Facebook messenger you. And if you owe money, you pay either by check, mail it to the address on the letter, or you can pay on the IRS website. But they're not going to ask for gift cards, Venmo, uh, Apple, what do you call those? Apple pay cards or whatever. So here's the notices you'll get. The CP14 is the first letter you get from the IRS saying, hey, you owe us money. It's a soft letter. This usually happens um, after you file your tax return. It's just a reminder that, oh, you forgot to pay your tax bill with the tax return. The second one's a CP500. It gets a little more aggressive. They said, it's going to say, you owe us money. If you don't, if you want to stop the interest and penalties, pay us by this date. It's usually 20 days after the letter. The next letter is LT11. That's a bit more aggressive. It's going to uh, it's gonna have on the top there saying, this is your last warning before uh, we're going to levy you. It's just a warning. That's the letter you get before CP504. That's the serious letter. It's in large, bold type, in a big font. It's going to say, final balance due reminder, notice of intent to seize or levy your property or rights to property, and also direct it to pay immediately. If you can't pay, there's a number on the upper right corner of the letter, and, and the IRS is really easy to work with. Um, in terms of figuring out a payment plan, depending on what you owe. If it's a small amount, they're not going to ask that many questions. They'll say, oh, can you pay $100 a month? Can you pay $200 a month or whatever it is? If you owe a large amount, then they're going to ask for more financial information. So, so take this very seriously because it can escalate and get very expensive. All right. Uh, let me just check the chat here because I think I saw a question here. Uh, Julie asked a question about the child tax credit. The child tax credit only applies for children of 17 or under, not 18, 17. Um, and it doesn't cover dependents uh, over 26 years old. So um, that's what's called the other dependent credit. That's $500. The child tax credit is $2,000. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. So here's the tax season dates for you to be aware of. Tax season date. So uh, January 16th was uh, like a week ago or so. And that's the due date for your fourth quarter 2023 estimated payment. You pay that on time, then they wouldn't charge you a late, late uh, penalty or an underpayment of estimated tax penalty. <clears throat> the IRS announced that January 29th is when the, they'll start accepting tax returns. But should, should, should you jump on that? Probably not, because a lot of forms are still not released yet. A lot of forms are not available yet. Also, um, <clears throat> California, we're in California here. Um, California hasn't released all their forms either. So I'd be cautious about that. Also, there could be some tax law changes. So I would be cautious about that. Now, if you have to file early because uh, you're, you're married filing separately, or you have a contentious situation with the parents of your children, that's a different story. So for the first time in many, many years, our due date's April 15th. Um, last year, April 15th was on a Saturday, and, th and then uh, Monday the uh, 17th was a holiday in Washington, D.C. It was Emancipation Day. So last year, the due date was April 18th. So for the last few years, we haven't had April 15th, and I think I checked the calendar. So this year, the next few years, is April 15th. <clears throat> However, if you're in Maine or Massachusetts, it's April 17th because we've got Patriots Day. <clears throat> <clears throat> now, you can file an extension to October 15th. The extension only gives you time to file the return, not to pay. You still got to pay your taxes by April 15th. If you don't pay by April 15th, there'll be interest and penalties. But, uh, you know, we, we probably need time sometimes because you might have complicated investments or it might take some time to gather your information. So, you know, pay what you think you owe by April 15th and file an extension. All right. Here's a picture of the 2023 1040. The next few slides, I kind of blown up the parts of it. So it looks very similar 
to 2022. Uh, the biggest difference I notice is that the filing status is moved from the top of the page to right below your name and address. So that's the most significant change, but I didn't notice any changes in the form this year. So starting at the top, we'll work our way down the forms. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, of course, get your name and address and your social security number. Now, it's really important that you enter your name correctly. That causes a lot of problems, especially if you change your name. If you do change your name, make sure it matches your social security card. Um, uh, some people change their names. They change it with DMV, but they didn't change it with the social security. That can cause problems with, uh, with uh, matching identity and all that. So make sure you get your name correctly. Filing status. And we're going to talk a little more detail about the... Uh, the, the filing status, but your choice is single, married filing jointly, married filing separately, head of household or qualifying surviving spouse. It's based upon your marital status as of December 31st. So I, 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 I was watching TV at uh, New Year's Eve and uh, a lot of idiots were getting married in Las Vegas. Why? Because it's going to be 12, 31, 23. Um, I guess people want that magic number. 1231-2023. So a uh, record number of people got married on Christmas, uh, New Year's Eve. Well, guess what? They're treated as if, it, as if they're married for the full year. That could be a problem, right? What if the person you married owes back taxes? Well, if you guys have a refund, the IRS is going to keep it. That could be a problem, right? Or uh, child support or whatever, those kind of issues. So, you know, before you marry somebody, you might want to do a credit check, you want to check on their tax situation because you could have some adverse consequences. So got to watch out for that. Same thing with uh, getting divorced, right? Uh, your divorce has to be final by December 31st. So I think in California, you got to get your paperwork in by at least June 30th to be able to even get divorced by the end of the year. So that can get a bit complicated. All right. So marital status is of December 31st. The head of household filing status seems to be the most confusing and the most abused and also the most misunderstood. And that can cause all kinds of problems with the IRS. So anyway, let's talk about the head of household filing status. It's for people who are unmarried, not married, right? Or considered to be unmarried. And, and you can still be married, and might be able to qualify for head of household. So to do that, it's the next five points here. File a separate return, no joint return. Um, you have to pay over half the cost of keeping up the home for the year. And the next one's really important. The spouse did not live in the home for the last six months of the year. I noticed that people tend to leave the household like in August. Well, guess what? That's not six months, right? So last six months of the year. And the home is the main home of the child, stepchild, or foster child for over half the year. And you must be able to claim that child's independent. So if you're still married and you meet these five tests here, you can file the head of household. Also, that means yeah, paying for over half the cost of keeping up the home. And the qualifying person uh, is your dependent that lives with you for at least half of the year. If that person is your parent, there's an exception for parents. They don't have to live with you. Parents do not have to live with you to qualify for head of household. Why would you want that status? Well, it's more favorable than filing single. Not as good as filing jointly, but better than filing singles. That's why it's, uh, it's an important consideration to think about. All right, here's a worksheet on how to calculate the cost of keeping up the home. If you guys get into an argument about this, Keep good records, but look what's on this list here. Property taxes, mortgage, rent, utilities, repairs, maintenance, property insurance, food, and other household expenses. So what's not on this list? Uh, clothing for the kids. That's not part of the cost of keeping up a home. Uh, vacations and, and uh, medical bills and those kind of things. Those don't count for the cost of keeping up the home. So... Um, and I see that mistake made a lot, too, where people are making all these arguments, but it's like, well, what goes into that calculation? Keep track of it, and whoever has the higher amount would, would qualify. Uh, here's a chart 
on who is a qualifying person to help you qualify as head of household. I am not going to go over this right now, but um, you can look at this later. And, and what's a common question we get? A real common question we get. I, I've got a boyfriend and he doesn't work. Well, my first question is, why do you have a boyfriend who doesn't work? Well, so can I claim as a dependent? Can I be head of household? Well, let's go through these tests here, right? And well, the main question, is that person a qualifying person? No, he's not related to you. No, don't adopt him. Okay, don't do that. So we get that a lot. Can I, can I, can I claim my boyfriend? The answer is no. <laughs> so you got to think a little deeper about that. Okay. Now, the IRS has something called Interactive Tax Assistant on their website. It's a pretty handy-dandy guide. Um, there's, there's, there's one of them that's called What is My Filing Status? So you can go to the IRS Interactive Tax Assistant and click on the, uh, the, the, the menu that says What is My Filing Status? It goes through a whole bunch of questions that, that basically are these tests to see if, uh, to figure what your filing status is. Okay. The next uh, line on the 1040 is the question about digital assets. And a couple of years ago, it was called cryptocurrency. Well, last year in 2022, the IRS changed it to digital assets because that's a more expansive description because it includes cryptocurrency, uh, NFTs, non-fungible toy tokens, um, stable coins, and any digital representation of value. That's... So that's, they've expanded that. So the question is yes or no. At any time during 2020, 2023, did you receive as a reward, award, or payment for property or services, or sell, exchange, or otherwise dispose of a digital asset? And, and don't lie, because the IRS already knows the answer to this, but um, uh, if, if you're holding cryptocurrency, let's say, but you didn't sell it, you didn't exchange, you didn't do anything with it, you can say no. You can say no to that. It's only when you have a transaction of some sort. You know, um, you mow someone's lawn, <clears throat> and 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 in payment, you didn't get cash. They gave you a Bitcoin. Well, that's, you have to say yes to that. That's going to be income at the value of the Bitcoin you receive. Uh, cryptocurrency is property. Digital assets are property. I know it's called cryptocurrency. It's not cash. It's not a security. So for tax purposes, we treat it as property, and any transaction you have is reportable on your Schedule D, which originates on Form 8949. Now, if you do have cryptocurrency, I hope you have a crypto, have it at a cryptocurrency exchange, because a cryptocurrency exchange at the end of the year will give you some nice statements to use for your tax return. Um, you might have to pay an extra fee, but I would highly recommend paying the extra fee to get them to generate the Form 8949 for you. Because if you want us tax professionals to do it, it'll take us hours and hours to do it, and we'll charge you a lot of money for it. So it'd be a whole lot better to have either the exchange do the calculation or um, or, or, or a third party that, that does those tax calculations for you. I highly recommend that. Well worth the fee. Now, okay. The next part of the 1040 is about the standard deduction. Most of us are claiming the standard deduction because it's pretty high. And we'll go over that in a second here, what the amounts is, are. But the, um, but the calculation um, is, is changed if you're a dependent. That's why there's a box here. Um, or you get a bonus to your, your standard deduction if you're over age 65. You're over age 65. You're born before January 2nd of 1959, or if you're blind, and blind is defined as a uh, vision of 200 over 20, and that's an extra bonus. Uh, if you're married, finally joining, it's an extra $1,500. Uh, if you're single, it's an extra 1850 So that's why these are important questions to make sure you answer, if it applies to you. So don't ignore that. So the standard deduction for married, finally joining is $27,700. What does that mean? If you're married filing jointly, the first $27,700 of income is tax-free. It's exempt from taxes. That's why this is so important. Look how high it is. It's $27,700. It was doubled back in 2018. Before that, the amount was half, half of this amount. 
If you're single, it's 13850 So for a lot of younger people or, or kids, like my uh, my son's in college now, but if he's working, he's working, um, he can make up to 13850 and not pay any taxes. And if he's a dependent, there's this calculation you do, the, the standard deduction is not the full amount, it's the greater of 1250 or their earned income plus $400 up to the amount of the standard deduction. So most of us are not itemizing because these are pretty high. These are pretty high. So, and and, and, um, and here's the bonus to, bonus to your standard deduction we talked about. So for example, if you're married filing jointly and you're over age 65, both of you are over age 65, it's gonna be 27,700 plus 3,000, that's $30,700. So the first, Almost $31,000 of income is tax-free if you're over 65. So that's a that's a pretty good tax break. That's why um, currently our taxes are relatively low. We're at record low taxes right now. However, one word of warning, our taxes will be going up in 2026 because that's when the tax cut in jobs that expires and these standard deduction amounts will be cut in half. So that's something we've got to be aware of, of 2026. Okay, so Julie's got a question. How do you report the kids' income theory of dependence? That's a good question, and it depends. There's something called the kitty tax. So if they have unearned income, interest, and dividends, then you can report on your tax return using Form 8814 if that's the case. However, if they're working or if they have their own capital gains, then that kid's going to file their own separate tax return. Okay, the next part of the tax return are your dependents. So if you notice the question about the digital assets, cryptocurrency, do you notice it comes before dependents? So do you know what that means? The IRS thinks cryptocurrency is more important than your children. That's why it's above the dependent questions. So that's why it's so important. And um, like I said, don't lie because the IRS already knows a lot of this information already because they have issued what's called John Doe summons to the various crypto exchanges and they have the information. They know if you made money on cryptocurrency. All right, so dependents here. Yeah, we gotta make sure we get their name, their social security number, input the relationship, son, daughter, brother, sister, parent, whatever, and then and then box four is, do they qualify for the child tax credit or the credit for other dependents? The child tax credit is $2,000. The other dependent credit is $500. So if your child is over age 17, then they're not going to qualify for the child tax credit, but they'll get the credit for other dependent, the $500 credit instead. So um, I don't know if you recall, this happened about, oh, about almost 40 years ago. The... Uh, the Congress was, was uh, suspecting people were lying on their tax returns. And so we have something called tins for tots, which means that uh, you're required to uh, put your kid's social security number on the tax return. Well, in 1987, we lost 7 million children. Yeah, <laughs> we lost 7 million children because you're required to input the kid's social security numbers. So... Um, I guess people are putting down their dogs, their cats, and uh, fictitious children. So that uh, hopefully that saves some money for the government. So here's a chart on rules for claiming a dependent. Again, I'm not going to go through the detail here because we don't have enough time, but this chart is for you to look at to um, see if your child qualifies as a dependent. Now, the IRS has these interactive tax uh, assistance. So there is a, a main page here. It was last updated January 16th, so it's pretty up to date. Just type in ITA on the IRS website, irs.gov, in the search box, type in ITA. It'll take you to this page of Interactor Tax Assistance. There's one for, who may I claim as a dependent? <clears throat> It'll go over all kinds of questions, all kinds of nosy questions about, um, uh, uh, about the person, to see that person qualifies. At the end of the of uh, the calculation, they'll say, ding, yes, this person qualifies, or no, it does not. Another one that's kind of helpful is, are my Social Security benefits taxable? 
because you know your tax social security be taxable up to 85% of the social security not 100% but up to 85%. It could be 50%, it could be 0, 50% or 85% depending on your level of income. It's based upon what's called your modified adjusted gross income. Okay. Um, another helpful one is uh, a lot of our kids get scholarships, right? Do I include my scholarship, fellowship, or education grant as income on my tax return? So you can go through this um, calculator to help you figure that out because that's another mistake people make is um, they, they don't report taxable scholarships. Scholarships can be taxable. Scholarships are tax-free. Scholarships and fellowships are tax-free if you used to pay for tuition uh, in a degree program. If you're no longer in a degree program, you still got a scholarship, then that'll be taxable. If it's being used to pay for room and board, that's taxable. So you got to watch out for that. Okay, so moving down the uh, Form 1040, uh, lines 1 through 15 are the income <clears throat> and, and adjustments to the income. So line one is, is your W-2 and other income there. Line two is your interest income, uh, uh, interest from the bank, B of A or Wells Fargo. That's box 2B, line 2B. 2A is your tax exempt interest. A lot of people think, well, it's tax exempt. Why should I put on a tax return? Well, it's part of the modified adjusted gross income calculation. So you don't want to leave that out. Also, on the California return, if it's coming from California bonds, the state of California, county of San Francisco, uh, San Francisco School District, uh, that's tax-free. However, if it's outside of California, it's taxable on the California return. <clears throat> um, line three is dividends. You can have it from stocks or mutual funds or exchange-traded funds. You have qualified dividends and ordinary dividends. Ordinary dividends are part of your income, but qualified dividends get a preferential uh, tax rate. It could be either at 0, 15%, or 20%. Okay, uh, line 4A are your IRA distributions. More importantly is 4B. That's the taxable amount. Always important to keep track of your basis of your non-deductible IRAs so you don't double pay or overpay taxes in your IRAs. 5A and 5B is your pension. Same thing. A portion of your pension might not be taxable. So we have to study the 1099R for your pension very carefully. There could be some um, tax-free part of it. So we don't want to put the whole amount. You can't just blindly uh, expect line two of the 1099R is correct. Line six is your Social Security benefits. 6A is the gross amount. 6B is the taxable amount. Could be 50% or 85% or somewhere in between. And uh, 6C is new from last year. That's using the lump sum election method. So if you get a lump sum of Social Security benefits, because sometimes it takes a long time for them to process it or to figure out this could be SSDI, those kind of things. So using a lump sum method means figuring out the taxes are for the years they were attributable to. It could be a lot lower that way. So being, being very diligent for your calculations are important. Line C, seven is capital gains and losses, selling stocks, selling mutual funds, selling your house, those kind of things, selling cryptocurrency. <clears throat> we're going to go over schedule one. That's line eight. That's the other income. And then line nine is the total of your total income. And then line 10 are adjustments to your income. That's on page two of schedule one. This is what gives us what's called above the line deductions. And that gives us line 11, the famous adjusted gross income. Very important number. Then we subtract from that the higher of your standard deduction or IMIS deduction. To the left of line 12 is uh, the standard deduction amounts. 13850 for singles, 27700 for married funding jointly. But if you have the uh, bonus amounts, that gets included also. Uh, if you have a business, line 13 is qualified business income deduction. And then line 15 is your taxable income. That's the number you figure out your taxes at. That's uh, uh, depending on what your tax bracket is. All right, schedule one. That's the additional income. I'm not going to go through every line. I'm going to go through the ones that you need to be aware of. Uh, most of us are not going to have a taxable refund on line one because of the higher standard deduction. However, line two, you got to be aware of. 
Line two is alimony. Alimony. If you're receiving alimony, it's taxable if it's from a, a marital settlement uh, before 2019, 2018 and earlier. It's taxable if you receive it. If you if you got divorced uh, this year or after 2019 or later, it's not taxable. And that's because of the change in tax law. So it's very important. That's why you see line 2B there, enter the date of the marital settlement. So that's very important to know. Uh, let's see. Line 3 is business income. Let's see. Any other lines? Oh, line 8B, gambling income. Gambling income. What's important there is don't make the mistake what a lot of people have done and they got in trouble for it is that we have gambling income. Line 8B, report the gross amount. I won $10,000, but I spent, I lost $8,000. Well, the mistake people were making where they entered $2,000, the net amount. No, you entered the gross amount on line 8B, you deduct your gambling losses to the extent of your gambling winnings on Schedule A. And we'll, we'll, we'll look at that a little bit later, but that's for gambling losses. Okay, I think that's mostly it right here in terms of income. So we talked about alimony. I think the most relevant would be alimony. And if you have a business or rental properties, then that income flows through here. Line seven is unemployment. Uh, it's taxable for federal, but not taxable for state. Uh, what I've noticed uh, uh, I've run into this year or last two years is people were getting uh, 1099Gs for unemployment that they didn't get or never applied for. So watch out for that. Uh, make sure you, you get the EDA involved with that fraud. Otherwise, you'll get a letter from the IRS saying, hey, you didn't pay taxes on this. And you tell them, I never got it. I never applied for unemployment. So it's a real mess. So I, I just went through this with someone. And the, 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 the way we got a lot of help uh, was through her state senator's office or, or assembly member's office. They have staff members who work with the EDD on these issues. So if you got a fraudulent 1099-G for EDD, um, make sure you get on top of that. Otherwise, IRS will, will say it's taxable and you know it becomes a big fight. So you got to watch out for that. Uh, let's see, line 8I, prizes and awards. I like to watch Jeopardy, right? Guess what? Those people in Jeopardy or Price is Right, that's all taxable. You'll get a 1099 from the TV show and you got to report that income on your tax return. Let's see, other ones I need to point out here. Uh, I think we're, we're pretty good here. Uh, I think we pretty much got things covered. Um, line M is kind of interesting. That's for the Olympics. So uh, any of our athletes, it might be taxable. So just because you win a gold medal, it's not tax-free, it might be taxable. On the back side of the Schedule 1 are adjustments like them. These are the above-the-line deductions. So I think the first one I want to point out is line 11, educator expenses. If you're a K-12 educator, that means being a teacher, a counselor, a librarian, a paraeducator, or whatever, a K-12, as long as you work more than 900 hours of the year, that's a $300 deduction. That includes out-of-pocket supplies, computers, uh, courses, and PPE. I mean, if you got to buy face masks, gloves, or sanitizers, that's line 11 here. Uh, let's see what else is here. Line 13, health savings account deduction. You got till April 15th to top off your 2023 health savings account deduction if you are in a health savings account. Uh, line 20, IRA deduction, same thing. You got till April 15th to fund an IRA to get a deduction on your 23 taxes. That can help reduce your taxes. Line 19A is alimony paid. If it's uh, alimony for a divorce before 2019, it's deductible. For divorces 2019 and later, not deductible. So what you got to watch out for is if you're renegotiating your alimony, uh, it depends on which side you're on. If you're on the recipient side, you want to um, put in the modification that this shall be taxed under the new tax law, which means tax-free. However, if you're the payer, you might want to say, well, since the the original agreement was before 2019, uh, we should apply 
the old law, which makes it deductible. So this is why it's important to get the tax professional involved with your lawsuits and divorces and all those kind of things. That way we get the right and best tax treatment. All right, above the line deduction, educator expenses, we just talked about that. That's the $300 deduction. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Um, oh, line H and I. So in, in general, you see those commercials on TV, right? From the lawyers saying, hire us. We're the best law firm to get you the biggest settlement. Well, if you win a lawsuit, it's generally going to be taxable. Back wages, punitive damages, injuries, those are going to be taxable. However, if it's for a physical injury, a physical injury, then it's tax-free. Now, if there's uh, emotional distress or mental issues or whatever, if you can tie the mental distress and the mental issues with the physical injury, then we can argue that would be tax-free. However, I would get an expert to write that letter from a psychiatrist, a psychologist, giving that expert opinion. What about the legal fees? Well, they're deductible as a miscellaneous deduction, which we currently don't have on your federal return right now. So we got to be careful about that when you're negotiating a settlement. I just ran to a case for uh, a young lady. She won $100,000 for back pay from her previous employer. They owed her $100,000. Well, the lawyers kept $60,000 of that for their fee and for out-of-pocket expenses. So she got a net of $40,000. Then she was asking, how do I pay taxes on it? You pay tax on the $100,000. Can't deduct the 60000 So I think she was probably left with very little money after all that. So got to negotiate those uh, legal settlements very carefully. There's two exceptions where we can deduct the legal fees above the line. Uh, line H is for unlawful discrimination claims. If it's an unlawful discrimination claim, of course, we want a, a lawyer to, to, to give us a legal opinion about that. Uh, you and I can't make that determination. Or legal fees for a whistleblower case against for the IRS. You're, you're turning in a former employer or you're, you know someone's cheating on their taxes. You turn them in. You can get a whistleblower uh, award, but um, you know it's complicated, so you might have to hire a specialized lawyer for that. Okay. So, so those are only two exceptions where we can deduct it above the line. Okay, I see a question from Allison here. Um, we explain uh, for IRA deduction, is that different from my employer for k Yes, it is. And it can be a uh, claim above and beyond your 401k, depending on what your income limit is, depending on what your income is. So there's some income limits to consider. And ellen has got a question. We explain F. Uh, what's F here? Um, let's see, uh, F under adjustments, contribution section 501c 18d plans. That's a, a very specific type of, uh, of a pension plan. So it's pretty obscure and most of us don't really have that. So that's why I'm not going to talk about it. It's very, very obscure. Okay. Schedule two are additional taxes we, we might need to pay. Um, uh, line one, alternative minimum tax. That, that used to be a real hot topic here in Silicon Valley, but because of the 2017 tax law change, the exemptions have been substantially increased, so we're not, most of us are not going to be paying AMT, so we're not going to see that. The, the exception would be people with incentive stock options. Okay, uh, line two, we do see that more often. If you get your um, health insurance through Covered California and you got a subsidy, however, your income might be too high to get the complete subsidy, you need to pay it back uh, via line two here. Excess advanced premium tax credit repayment. Uh, so that's what we got to be careful about um, working with Cover California, reporting the appropriate amount of income, because some people like to get a big subsidy, but it can get very expensive. You have to pay it all back. So you got to be real careful about that. Line four, self-employment tax. That's if you have your own business and and, and you pay your Social Security tax through your self-employment tax. I think those are the most uh, relevant ones we're going to talk about today. Um, on the other side are other taxes. And mostly, those are mostly the penalty taxes. If you made a contribution to an IRA, an HSA, that you weren't eligible for, it's a 6% penalty. Or if you took money out of your health savings account and didn't use it for medical expenses, 
that's a 20% penalty. So that's pretty expensive, which if you do have a health savings account, use it for medical. We always have plenty of medical expenses. So you never run out of medical expenses because that 20% penalty is pretty expensive. Schedule three. Schedule three are credits. And what's a credit? A credit is a dollar for a dollar reduction in tax. Way better than a deduction, right? So I put in yellow here the new credits to be aware of, and we'll talk about them a little bit more. Line 5A is the residential clean energy credit. That's putting on solar panels in your house, a windmill, a fuel cell, and a battery. And 5B is energy efficient home improvement credit, and we'll talk about that in a lot more detail in terms of adding windows, doors, insulation, uh, new furnaces to your house, and those sorts of things. And then line M is a new credit for previously owned clean vehicles, a used electric car. That's a new credit. That's a new credit um, that we didn't have last year. So, um, so we'll talk about these in just a second here. And then on the other side is a new refundable credit. That's if you have a business. If you have business credits. That's for 3,800. Um, you, can, you can take what's called an elective payment election which is just pure money to you there. So that's that's kind of new. So let's spend a few minutes on these energy efficient home improvement credits. So this came as a result of the Inflation Reduction Act that was passed in August of 2022. Kicks in in 2023. So it's a substantial enhancement over the previous credit. Previously, it was a $500 lifetime credit. That's all you got. Once you got to $500, you couldn't take more. Now it's $1,200 annually, and also it's been expanded to include your second home, your vacation home, not rental properties. Uh, Energy.gov gives us a detailed list of uh, what are the qualified improvements and which appliances qualify and those kind of details there. But the improvements could be your doors, windows, insulation, uh, central air conditioners, heat pumps, heat pump water heaters, biomass stoves, boilers, and home energy audits. So. It's a $1,200 credit. The limits are $250 per door or $500 in total, $600 for windows. So sometimes you might want to, you know, plan your windows. Uh, maybe we'll do windows on this side of the house this year, and maybe we'll do the other side next year or something like that because the limit is $600 per year. $150 for a home energy audit. I know PG&E does this for free, but uh, these home energy audits are these... Um, uh, experts who who look at your house, they'll take an infrared picture of your house, and you, you can see where all you're leaking your heat or whatever. You might be missing some caulking in certain areas, so that's why you might want to buy one. But the credit is under fifty dollars. There's an extra two thousand dollar credit uh, if you get a qualified heat pump, heat pump water heater, a biomass stove or biomass boiler. Yeah, no lifetime limit. However, this is not a refundable credit. So if your liability is less than twelve hundred, um, uh, that's it. You know, if your liability is only five hundred bucks, that's all you get. There's no refund created by these credits. So residential clean energy credit—that's for solar, wind, geothermal, solar water heaters, fuel cells, and a battery. That's changed. In 22 and before, the battery had to be connected to the solar system. Now it could be a standalone battery system. I'm still not sure about that because they're kind of expensive and they kind of catch fire and they tend to explode. So I'm waiting for technology to get better. I'm waiting for the cost to go down. So I'm not rushing the battery thing. Uh, but the 30% credit of what these costs are up to 2032. And this is reported on 456.95. So it's only... For the solar, we get this question a lot where there's a lot of unfortunately bad contractors out there and they'll say, hey, I'll give you a free roof. I'll put, a, I'll, put, I'll put the whole invoice on the solar panels, but you can't do that. You can't count the roof. If you're getting a new roof, rafters and, and shingles and all that, that's not going to count. So watch out for those bad contractors. I'm just going to say it out loud. I don't recommend any of the ones who advertise. Because they check out the consumer reviews. They're pretty bad. So watch out for that, you know, and, and, and I would fact check them uh, before you sign up with them. Also, you want to make sure you're paying the best price. 
I got solar panels. Well, guess what? My tax credit is half of my neighbor's. Why? My neighbor got the same number of solar panels I got, but he paid twice as much because he is not a CPA like me. I shop around. I make sure I get the right vendors and the right contractors. Uh, my vendor did a great job. I paid a really good price. I'm really happy with that. My neighbor across the street paid twice as much. Don't know why. Or I see a lot of neighbors or I drive around. I see houses with a lot of solar panels. It's like, do they really need that many? You should match the panels with the amount of power you need. You know, also, I see houses are covered by trees and tall buildings, and they're in the shadow all day. So, you know, some of these solar people are not there to help you. They're just there to sell you solar panels. So don't overpay, all right? Okay, so roofs don't count. Uh, if you buy a brand new house, uh, I know in Monterey County, all those new houses you see being built in Monterey County, they're required to have solar panels. So you're buying a brand new house or you're buying it from a flipper or something like that. He put solar panels in. Ask him how much you paid for that and then they'll give you a statement and that's what you can use for the credit. So new houses count. New construction counts. Um, yeah, for some reason, we can't use solar water heating for pools or hot tubs. So I would recommend calling our Congress member and say, can you make that correction? Come on. I mean, it makes a lot of sense to use solar energy to heat your water your swimming pools, right? Uh, no solar air heaters. Uh, there's fuel swells and batteries, but I'm not pushing the batteries because they're expensive and there are chemicals in there. They're volatile. Here's a couple of examples. Go over some examples of how this works. You got two doors. They're a thousand bucks a piece. So 30% of a thousand is $300. The maximum credit for doors are $250 each. So two times 250 is $500. So you got $500 for the doors. Skylights and windows, $2,200. 30% of that is $660. The limit is $600. You switched out your air conditioner uh, to something more efficient. It's $5,000. 30% of $5,000 is 1500 That's $600. So five plus six plus six is 1700 The maximum is 1200 so that's how much we can claim is $1,200 in this example. So you might want to plan your windows or whatever to spread it out over, over a couple of years, maybe. Same facts as number one, except instead of getting uh, an HVAC, we got an electric heat pump instead, and it costs $5,000. So 30% of 1500 is um, 1500 is, uh, oh, 30% of 5000 is 1500 the limit is $2,000, and it's above and beyond the $1,200 limit. So in this case here, we get five for the door, six for the windows, $1,500 for the heat pump. That's $2,600. But I've asked around. Heat pumps are expensive. So in this example, same facts, except the heat pump costs $8,000. So 30% of $8,000 is $2,400. That's uh, the limit is $2,000. We also got an energy audit. That's $150 bucks there. So we get the twelve hundred dollar uh, energy efficiency credits plus the two thousand. So you get the maximum thirty two hundred dollar credit. I had to go through this decision myself personally. My water heater blew up, and so I thought about: it. should I get a heat pump water heater and all that? Have you seen how much they cost? They're about fifteen hundred dollars more than your traditional water heater. Also, it's electric. I would have to hire an electrician to fix my electrical system at home. And, and that would have taken a while. And I kind of want my hot water. So I got an efficient water heater. I, the original water heater that the previous owner put in was 75 gallons. I got a 50-gallon water heater. It's been working fine. I'm using less gas. I got hot water the next day. Because um, it would have cost a few thousand dollars more if I got the heat pump. Yeah, I would have got the $2,000 tax credit, but would have been worth it? Not if I had to wait two weeks for hot water and also spend a few thousand dollars more or so. I didn't do that. So don't let tax credits drive your decisions. See what makes sense. Don't overpay. I'm waiting for the technology and the cost to get better. Heat pump water heaters are still very expensive. Maybe when they make more of them, the price will probably go down. Maybe technology would get better. So, you know, they've always been expensive because they don't sell that many. Okay, clean vehicles, substantial changes to the rules from 2022. 
The big change is that starting in 2024, you can get the tax credit up front, which is what I'd recommend. Because if it turns out that you can't use the whole $7,500 credit because your tax liability is below that amount, you don't have to pay it back. So it makes sense to get the credit up front. What's the risk, though? If you don't qualify for the credit because your income's too high, you have to pay it back on your tax return. So the maximum is $7,500. You get it through a licensed dealership. Uh, there's MSRP uh, limits on the vehicles, $80,000 for vans, SUVs, and pickup trucks, $55,000 for sedans. And, and income limits, it's this year or previous year. So $300,000 if you're married, $150,000 if you're single. So if you're above those amounts, you're not going to get the credit. So if you're below that amount, yeah, you will. And the credit's a maximum of $7,500. Uh, um, it could be $3,750. It depends on the battery. And it's got to be manufactured in North America. But I'll show you some websites that has all this information because I don't need to you know, I don't know where the cars are made. I don't know anything about the batteries, but that's okay. The Department of Energy figured that out for us. Here's the uh, information for used electric cars. Uh, the credit's up to $3,000, but the car can't cost more than $25,000. So I'm not sure if you can get a car for $25,000. The AGI limits are less, $150,000 for married, $75,000 for singles. I personally don't think we're going to see much of this. One, can you buy an electric car, a used car for $25,000 or less? It's got to be two years uh, older than the current year. So we're in 2024. So it's got to be a 22 model or older. What happens when you buy a used electric car? You might have to buy a new battery. How much do those batteries cost? 20 grand, right? 15 grand, 10 grand. So I'm not sure if this is really that great of a credit. So before you rush up to buy a used electric car, Check the condition of the battery because that's going to be really expensive. The most lucrative uh, credit for uh, electric cars are commercial clean vehicles. If you have a business, oh, the, the, the AGI limitation doesn't apply. The North America limitation doesn't apply. The battery limitation doesn't have to apply. It's a $7,500 credit if the car weighs less than 14,000 pounds. If it weighs more than $14,000 pounds, it's a $40,000 credit. That's huge. What's a four, what's a 14,000 pound car? It's those Amazon trucks out there. You see those electric Amazon trucks? Those are 14,001 pound. That's what that is. Okay. And here's the websites you can look at. Fueleconomy.gov. Uh, I think that's Department of Energy website. Uh, it, it, it's got a, you know, what you can do to make it easy is if you're not sure about your car, type in the VIN number into the website. Ding, it'll tell you what the credit is. So the VIN number will be specific to your vehicle. It'll tell you what the battery's situation is and what the um, or what the manufacturer situation is. Because I don't know uh, if that car is like a BMW. A lot of them are made in uh, Spartanburg, North Carolina, or South Carolina. So um, even though it's a BMW. Okay. I'm kind of picking up my pace here because um, our time is going a bit quick. Okay, if you can itemize, here's Schedule A. We're going to walk through Schedule A here. So first part of Schedule A, what are first itemized deductions? Medical and deductible dental expenses. It has to exceed 7.5% of your adjusted gross income. That's why that line is so important on your 1040. So, you know, I think we can think of your normal medical expenses like uh, uh, and the magic words are expenses incurred for the cure, prevention, and mitigation of disease. So, you know, co-pays, uh, out-of-pocket uh, fees, lab fees. Uh, if you're on Medicare, they don't cover eyes. They don't cover your eyes, ears, or teeth, right? So those are out-of-pocket expenses. Hearing aids, oh God, they're expensive. A client got those new digital hearing aids. $4,500. How did I know that? Well, she got their brand new digital hearing aids. She looked into the San Francisco Bay. She just happened to be looking into San Francisco Bay. She got hit by a gust of wind. Boom! Her hearing aids ended up in the bay. $4,500 in the bay. God, that's expensive. So my recommendation, you are going to get those high-priced hearing aids. Buy the insurance. 
I think it was only $150. Well worth it. Buy the insurance. You never know if, if you're going to lose your hearing aids in the San Francisco Bay or not. Uh, the other medical expenses, uh, uh, I have a client in, um, he, he lives in San Francisco. San Francisco is a bit hilly. So his house is three levels. You walk in the front door, that's the living room and kitchen, uh, room upstairs, his bedroom's downstairs. Well, he lost a leg. He lost a leg. He was on Coumadin. He didn't die, but he lost a leg. And because of that, he couldn't, he couldn't navigate his house. So he had to put an elevator in his house. Uh, and the year we did it, it cost $17,000. So we took that as a medical deduction. Uh, he also remodeled his uh, bathroom so he can use the toilet, so he can shower. Uh, he had to put a wheelchair ramp in front of his house so he can wheel into his, uh, his house. Those are all deductible as a medical expense. You cannot double count as your basis in your home. So don't, don't add it to your cost basis if you're going to deduct it. This makes sense if you're itemizing and it helps reduce your taxes. So, okay. The next one are taxes you pay. Well, the, if you look at line E here, the limit's $10,000. Well, you know, we're in the Bay Area, you know, state taxes, property taxes, you easily get to 10,000 bucks pretty darn quickly and that's all we can deduct. Okay. Uh, mortgage, the deductible limit for a mortgage is currently $750,000 of principal. If you got your loan before December 15th to 17th, that's a million dollars. So uh, a common question I get here in the Bay Area is uh, uh, you have two people own a home together, but they're not married, not married. So that means each of them get the $750,000 limit. So that gives you another excuse for not getting married. That can save you a lot of money. If you get married, you're down to one $750,000 limitation. Smaller deduction, right? Giving money to charity, great way of reducing your taxes. Just make sure you get a, a thank you letter and a receipt if it's $250 or more. Uh, if you give um, non-cash, like used clothing and all that, more than $500, make sure you include Form 8283. If you decide to give non-cash contributions of more than, more than $5,000, you need a qualified written appraisal. And what, what is part of that? Cryptocurrency. If you're going to donate cryptocurrency, get an appraisal of the cryptocurrency. You can't rely on the exchange. The exchange says, hey, it's worth 10 grand. Well, that's great, but you need an appraisal for that. Okay, I'm going pretty quick here because we're running out of time. So I can circle back in more detail if you guys have questions. I see a lot of questions coming in the chat. I will get back to them. Okay, casualty and theft losses. Oh, yeah, you know, you get your catalytic converter stolen, your bike gets stolen, or your car gets hit or whatever, and your insurance doesn't cover it. Not deductible because it's not part of a federally declared disaster. We've had a few of those, right? We had the winter storms last year. Uh, we had um, the wildfires. Those were federally declared disasters. So if you have losses as a result, as a result of those federally declared disasters, yes, we can claim those losses. Line 16, other itemized deductions, that's where you put your gambling losses. And then line 17 is your itemized deductions. If it's greater than your standard deduction, by all means, we claim this. And here's a summary of the standard deduction. Well, look at 22. Uh, let's just focus on married filing joining. 25,900 for 2022. Look, at, it jumped to 27,700 in 23 because we had high inflation in 22. And then we had high inflation in 24. Not as high as 22, but... Uh, we still had high inflation in 23, um, so it went up. It's now 29,200 for 24. Single people, 14,600. That's the amount of tax-free income you can have as long as you're working. Okay, the back side of Form 1040. That's the taxes, payments, and refund amount. Uh, let's go into detail here. So taxes, line 16. That's where you figure out your tax liability. Now, if you have capital gains, you get the preferential rates there. Um, but we have, um, let's see, line 19 is the child tax credit or credit for other dependents that we talked about earlier. That's $2,000 for a child, 
$500 for other dependents. So that's that's very important there. Line 23 are other taxes, most notably it'll be, um, it'll be um, self-employment tax. And then here's a chart of the tax brackets. So let's just go, let's hop to 24 here. So, you know, most, I don't know, depending on where your income is for singles, you don't hit the tippy top tax bracket until you're at $609,000. Married filing joint, $731,000. So I have clients complaining, oh, I'm in such a high tax bracket. No, you're not. You're in a 24% bracket. You're in a 22% bracket. You got a ways to go before you hit the top tax bracket. So, but, but at these levels of taxable income is what bracket you're in. So that's that that's something to consider when it comes to our tax planning. Okay. And then we get the payments. Yeah, your payments could be through your withholding. That's line 25A, your W-2. 1099, that could be through your pension, right? Uh, also through your Social Security and withholding through there. I like to have as much taxes taken out that way. It's a lot easier than writing checks. Uh, line 25 are estimate payments. You either pay by check or you pay online or whatever. I prefer to pay online, to pay on the IRS website, irs.gov slash direct pay. A lot safer nowadays. It's a bit dangerous to mail a check because uh, they either lose it, it doesn't get cashed, and then they say you didn't pay, then they impose interest and penalties. So pay it online. Best way to go. You get a confirmation number and a receipt too. That's really helpful. Uh, let's see here. Um, line 28, additional child tax credit. That's a number that could possibly change. We'll see what happens. Line 29, American opportunity credit. That's uh, the tuition credit for your kids in college. All right. So, so line 33 is the total of all your payments. If that number is bigger than your liability, then you have a refund. Uh, if it's uh, less than you owe, um, if you have a refund, you know, don't, don't take a check. Don't take a check for federal estate. Have it direct deposit. So line 35 B and D can enter your routing number and your account number. Make sure it's a, a good bank account. Um, it gets confusing if you enter a wrong bank account there, like an account that's closed. So the IRS knows your uh, bank account already anyway. So get a direct deposit. Because one of my clients, she, her, it just so happened her federal and state refund was in the same mail truck. And the mailman got mugged. He got mugged. And, and so her refund checks got stolen. To make it worse, the person who stole it signed her name. And we, we got a copy of the canceled checks. It's really creepy to see someone sign your name. It took almost a year to get the refund. It was a real pain. So... For now on, she's getting her refunds, direct deposit. Okay. Uh, if you owe, same thing. Don't, don't send a chat. That just hasn't been working so well. However, if you look at line uh, 35A, uh, you can use form, 30, uh, form 8888 to allocate your refund up to three accounts. You can go to a checking account, savings account, an IRA account, HSA account to fund your IRA or HSA. But look at part two. Part two is savings bonds. You can buy up to $5,000 of savings bonds for yourself or for other people, like for your kids or grandkids, $5,000. Way easier than doing it online with Treasury Direct. And uh, I think my next slide is about I-bonds. So you get I-bonds. They pay for 30 years. It's risk-free. You only pay federal tax, no state tax on that. Uh, I stands for inflation, so adjust twice a year. Uh, May the 1st and November the 1st. So the last adjustment was May the 1st of 23. And until April 30th of 24 is 5.27%. What do you think? Inflation is kind of cooling off, right? So maybe in May it'll go down. So maybe we want to buy those bonds before May 1st of 24. Uh, look at uh, May of 22, the October of 22. Remember the sky high inflation we had? Look at, look at what those pay. 9.62%. Wow. So it's based on inflation. It's to protect you from inflation. It's not for your everyday money, but I think it's a, a great way of saving, right? And, and you can't buy that much anyway. You're limited to $5,000 for the refund. Or if you buy it from the, the U.S. government, it's $10,000. So I'm not telling you to put all your money in there. I'm showing the bottom of your tax return because look at sign here. What does it say there? Under penalties of 
perjury. I declare that I have examined this return and accompanying schedules and statements, and to the best of my knowledge and belief, they are true, correct, and complete. Right? You're signing under penalties of perjury. That's very serious. So take it seriously. And it's amazing how people don't do that, and they get into big, big trouble. So don't lie. Don't cheat. Uh, I've been doing this for 38 years. Um, people try to lie. Well, anybody who try to cheat, they're not my clients. They're ex-clients. Because um, you don't save any money by cheating. So what's the point of cheating? It doesn't save you any money. So it doesn't help. Okay. In the final minutes here, let's go over really quickly here. What can you do to lower your taxes now? Well, take advantage of your pre-tax retirement plans, your 401k, 403b, 457 TSPs. Uh, uh, if you qualify for a traditional IRA, contribute to it. You got to April 15th of 24. So you can figure out if that will help you or not. Take advantage of the health savings account. I'm a big fan of that. That you can you you have to use a high deductible health plan, but what's the advantage? Lower premiums. And you got to April 15th. Of 2024 to fund to top off your 23 deduction, and that's reported on Form 8889. If you're over 70 and a half and you have an IRA account, don't write checks to your charities. Take it out of your IRA account because you're not getting deduction anyway. You're most likely not itemizing, so you can distribute up to a hundred thousand dollars from your IRA to your favorite charities. Um, it fulfills your required minimum distribution. So the, the money has to go directly from the IRA to the charity. For 24, that goes up to $105,000. And if you want to know more about it, we can talk about some more. How else can you lower your taxes? Adjust your withholding. Make sure it's uh, uh, enough. Or bump up your withholding if you're getting Social Security. Have withholding on your Social Security. Uh, make sure you have enough taken out of your IRA distributions or whatever. Because if you don't have enough taken out, you're going to owe... And, and if you can't pay it all now, it's going to cost you more because you got interest and penalties and, and estimated payments too. So, so um, paying your taxes will save you money. Okay. How can you lower your taxes in the future? And this can be a totally different seminar is uh, taking advantage of Roth contributions. And like uh, Jonathan's putting in the chat here, staying out of trouble. <laughs> And, and 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 not getting into tax trouble, but you know, Roth contribution, the backdoor Roth, a mega backdoor Roth. If you have a home, keep track of your home improvements. That's gonna be pretty important when you sell your home. How do you figure out what the basis is? Don't throw that away. There's gonna be tax considerations in any of our life changes. If your spouse dies, or if you die, if you get married, you get divorced, or you have a kid, you know, these all change uh your uh, tax planning and something to be considered here. If you're a business owner, if you're a business owner, you have a business. We've heard a lot about the employee retention credit. Uh, well, what the IRS has now is the IRS withdrawal program. If you submitted an ERC claim, but you, but 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 you don't qualify, um, the IRS allows you to withdraw it without any penalties or anything like that. Uh, that's ongoing right now. No deadline on it. However, let's say you got the ERC, you cashed the check already. Uh-oh. Well, the IRS just implemented the Volunteer Disclosure Program where you go, uh-oh, I don't deserve it. I, I know a person. He got a million dollars ERC. He doesn't qualify. Why did he get it? His buddies all got it. They don't qualify. Well, with this Volunteer Disclosure Program, until March 22nd of 2024, you can uh, pay back only 80% without any interest or penalties. So we'll see what happens with that. Otherwise, there's going to be an audit, and, and then the, there's no for you're going to pay the whole thing plus interest and penalties. So that's a big topic. The other topic, if you're a business owner, you have a business entity, is this thing called the Corporate Transparency Act. It's for beneficial ownership information reporting. The government wants to know who owns your business because of money launderers, tra human traffickers, oligarchs, and all that stuff. So it's uh, it's administered by FinCEN, the Financial Crimes Network. Um, for existing businesses, you got till January 1st of 25 to report. If it's a brand new business, you got to do it within 90 days of creation. 
However, if there's any corrections, updates, or changes, you got to do it within 30 days. And there's some nasty penalties, $500 a day penalties or up to $10,000 imprisonment up to two years. So, um, you know, that's kind of a big deal. So uh, some resources, I got you the link to the Form 1040 that we just went over and the instructions to the 1040. Publication 17 is a great comprehensive booklet, your federal income tax. It's only 142 pages. I love reading it. Um, I, I know in, in, in the San Francisco Main Library, you guys have a, a VITA or tax aid. I'm here in San Mateo. Uh, I'm actually here at the College of San Mateo. We have the VITA program that's going on right now as we speak on Saturdays. Uh, if, if you're in the San Mateo community, you can sign up. You can check to see what VITA sites are close by. There's income limitations and complexity limitations too. If you have a complex return, you won't qualify. Speaking of the Corporate Transparency Act, I am giving a free presentation with the Better Business Bureau uh, on Wednesday, February 21st, 2024. It's at nine o'clock Pacific time. And here's the link to register for that. So I'm gonna go over all the details about the Corporate Transparency Act and what you need to do to comply. It's very complicated. So, but I, I, I thought it's very important to, to have this presentation and hopefully uh, many people apply. So spread the work to your people who own the uh, business entities. So take a look at that. And I think that takes us to our last slide. And I think we're doing okay with the time. Okay, so, so Jonathan, um, I'm going to turn off the share, and I'm going to work on answering questions as long as, uh, as long as we can. How much time do we have? Um, about six minutes, but we can we can go over a few minutes if uh, if necessary. Okay, um, let's let's any, say ten any, minutes. Okay. When, why don't you give your closing statements, and I'll just work work our way through the questions here. Okay. Well, no, just I, I really want to thank you, Larry. Um, this was a great presentation. Um, I personally found it very helpful. Um, and yeah, we're really lucky to, to have you here. I'm very generous with your, your time and your expertise. Um, I just want to um, thank everyone else for joining us today. We'll get to your questions and uh, please check out our other tax programming that we have coming up. I put some links in the, the chat for those. Um, those should be good compliments to, uh, to Larry's program today. So I'll let Larry get back to the questions. Okay, so let me let me uh, let me get to the questions here. Okay, let's see. Some of these we already answered. Okay, I'm, I'm starting chronologically, so the earlier ones um, first. And Lily has got a question about the 1099 miscellaneous requirement. Uh, it's still six hundred dollars under the current year. The thousand dollar proposals in the proposed legislation, so that's not law yet. And that would take an effect in 24, not, not retroactive 23. But but you still gotta follow, you have to include, you have to include all your income. Doesn't matter if you got a 1099 or not. So for example, in my office, around the corner from my office is a chiropractor. He drives a yellow Corvette. Okay, he drives a yellow Corvette. He came in for a tax consultation. And I I looked at his tax returns. I why do you keep amending your returns? Why do you keep correcting your returns? Oh, I keep amending because I keep getting these 1099s. I go, no. No, you're supposed to report all your income. You should have a system to keep track of all your income. It doesn't matter if you got 1099 or not. Go, no, 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 no. I only report what I get in 1099s. I go, no, because you get co-pays, you get cash payments and all that. You got to report all your income. doesn't matter if you got 1099 or not. Well, since he cheats on his taxes, he's not working on my back. So he did not become my chiropractor because I told him to go away. I don't work with tax cheaters. I can't afford it. I have a license to maintain. Okay, so no, you report all your income. Doesn't matter if you get 1099 or not. Okay, okay. Oh, Wendy's got a question. Should I report 1098 T, 1098 tuition on parent and child tax return? That's a good question. So if it's your child who's a dependent, then then uh, if and you can qualify for the American Opportunity Credit, then of course that goes on your tax return. Now, if the child is not a dependent, then they file on their tax return. Okay, Gail's got a question. How does rounding work? Well, rounding is uh, 
If it's uh, 0.5 or higher, that goes up to the next dollar. 0.5 or less goes goes down. So, for example, hundred dollars, hundred dollars and twenty five cents. That's round to hundred dollars. Hundred dollars and sixty two cents. That's round to eleven dollars. Okay. Allison's got a question for the IRA deductions that differ from my employer for RK. Yes, it is because that's a contribution to an IRA account. However, deductibility is based upon your level of income. Okay. All right. Okay. So is the $10,000 maximum deduction on property tax that includes mortgage insurance, interest service? Oh, the $10,000 state and local tax deduction. That's only for state and local taxes, property taxes, income taxes, uh, DMV fees, and those kind of things. Interest is a separate line. The limitation of interest, uh, if you get the loan after uh, December 15th of 17th, it's $250,000 of principal. If it's before that, it's a million dollars. And no deduction for home equity loans. There used to be a $100,000 uh, allowable amount to be deducted, not anymore. Okay, Daniel, federal free fileable. Okay, I, I you know I really can't talk about federal free file because I'm not really up on that, and I don't really, really haven't been paying any attention to it because um, I don't think that's a good idea. Taxes are incredibly complicated, so you know if you only do it once a year, oh, that's a lot of that's a steep learning curve. I I, I I'm not comfortable with that to be honest with you, and also. Um, it's being oversold by the government, and I don't really believe it. Okay, Gail's got a question. Do the EVs need to be manufactured in the U.S. for credit? Uh, it's North America, which includes Canada, U.S., and Mexico. So North America required for personal. For business, doesn't matter. Is line of credit interest deductible? No. How long do you have to own the car? After you took the credit. Well, you have to own the car, right? You can't resell it. What does the door and window has to do to qualify? Okay, you're talking about a home energy efficient credit? Yeah, if you get a new window, get a door, they'll qualify. 30% of that cost will be for the home energy improvement credit. Okay, Daniel, my niece started a job last year. I want to help her open an IRA for income earned. Oh, good job, Uncle Dan. I don't think she would have earned enough to file taxes. No problem. So for determined gross income, do I just use the amount of W-2? What if the job is tip-based? Not sure if the employer factors in W-2, blah, blah, blah. Oh, that's a good question. Well, first of all, you know, if her taxes are going to be zero because if she made less than um, the standard deduction, then if her taxes are zero, I would just go with the box one amount, the W-2 amount, if it's more than 6,500, the limit is 6,500 for 23. If it's less than 6,500, I'd just go with box one. In a Roth IRA. So Roth IRA makes the most sense for her. And here's the beauty. Um, to have a qualified Roth IRA, you have to have it for at least five years. So if she's young, five years from now, she'll have a qualified Roth IRA. Yay. Good job, Uncle Dan. Okay. Is there a tax credit for installing EV charger at home? Yes, there is. However, it's only restricted to rural areas and low-income areas. Um, there's a website to type in your zip code to see if you qualify, but I don't think we have any of those here in the Bay Area. Can you refer a solar panel you use? Not publicly. Okay. What about tax credit for insulating the home? Yes, that's part of the home energy efficient credit. That's uh, part of that uh, Six hundred dollar uh, limit. Okay, so when your income's above the limit, can you get the EV credit up front? Yeah, uh, you get the credit up front if your income's too high. It's based on this year's income or last year's income. If the income's too high, you gotta pay it back. It's on the tax return. You gotta pay it back. If you got to seventy five hundred, gotta pay it back to seventy five hundred. Can you get the EV credit every year? Uh, 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 what is this? Every three years, I think. Every three years, I think you can't get it every year. I, I don't have that memorized. Um, but you can get it. Your spouse can get it. Something like that. If we sell or use things online, such as eBay or Poshmark, are we considered in business? I file a business or as an individual. Ah, very good question here. That's a good question, Monica. So it depends, right? 
if I'm just, yeah, getting rid of my used clothes and making some money on it, it's, 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 um, and you probably paid more for it, right? So for example, let's say you sold something at eBay, you got 700 bucks. eBay sends you a 1099 for 700 bucks, but that item costs you a thousand. So on schedule one, you report to 700 hours of income because that's the 1099 you got from eBay. On page two of schedule one, you deduct $700. You can't claim a loss, $700, because seven minus seven is zero. All right, if we sell items online for family members in different states, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that gets a lot more complicated when you're dealing with state taxes. So got to be careful about that because you might have to file another state tax return. Okay. What if I donate 10 times of 500, ends up to be 5,000, still need a clue form? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a case that just uh, happened last year. And I think these people are in San Francisco. They were so clever. They went to Salvation Army, Salvation Army and Goodwill, 173 times. They're so clever. They think they can uh, get away with not having to get a receipt because they said every time I did it was less than $250. So I don't need a receipt. No, it's treated as if it's one donation. It was over $5,000. No appraisal. Er, they lost a whole deduction. So don't be clever, okay? If you think you're being clever, they've already thought about it. Okay. Form 8283 is for $500. Yeah, $500. If you give, if you donate more than 500 bucks, fill out the Form 8283. Okay. Okay, how do you know a backdoor Roth is beneficial? How to best do a backdoor Roth? I'll tell you what. Tell Jonathan to have us do a seminar on that, okay? Because that's a big, big, big topic. If a college class includes a trip overseas, does the trip expenses consider as college expense for tax purposes? No. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Thank you. Can I claim my son is dependent on my federal tax and file for his own estate taxes? No. You have to be consistent. You can't say, oh, he's a dependent for federal purposes, not for state purposes. Can't do that. Do, does IHS get included in income? Ah, oh, thanks for bringing that up, Anna. That's a good question. So uh, if you do receive IHSS, I, it stands for what? In-home health services, and it's tax-free. So it's not including income, so it's tax-free. However, for purposes of IRAs, it's treated as earned income. So you can put a Roth IRA against it. I would recommend a Roth IRA against this. So let's say I got $10,000 IHSS. I could put up to 6,500 bucks in there. Pretty good deal there. Can I split interest with my brother if he's not in the savings account? Okay, Joe. So can I split interest with my brother? Does that mean you guys have a bank account together? Well, probably not a good idea. So if you look at the 1099, whose social security number is on the 1099? Probably yours, right? Okay. How to report charitable contributions via QCD? Ah, good question. So um, so you'll report it on, you'll report it on line 4A of the 1040. So let's say it's $10,000. And I gave the whole $10,000 to my favorite charity. So 4B will be zero. On the, the line next to 4B, I put the letters QCD for qualified charitable contribution distribution. If you're using tax software, there's a box to check to report that. For um, paperwork purposes for your files, make sure you get a thank you letter from the charity and you get a uh, receipt from the uh, investment company or the financial institution that holds the IRA, showing it coming from the IRA account to the charity, and then you'll be good. Okay, Christina, let's see. Let me get to your question, Christina. Foreign account. Ah, we didn't talk about foreign accounts. Okay. Hong Kong Bank says, if I need to report any interest for that foreign account, I received a certain amount of money compensation for moving out of a rental property. That property belongs to a nonprofit making organization, which is going to redevelop the whole housing estate. Do I need to report the compensation? Oh, okay. All right. On Schedule B, on the bottom of Schedule B, if you have an overseas account, no matter how much money is in there, you got to check yes to that box. However, if you have more than $10,000 in an overseas account, you need to fill out Form FBAR Form 1114A. 
to report that foreign bank account and the highest balance and the account number and the address of the financial institution. So that's with FinCEN. So that is required. Now, this sounds like you got paid some money for moving out of a rental property. Um, yeah, what is that? Is that income? Most likely. So, so it just happens in San Francisco. I call them extortion fees. You know, to get rid of a tenant, you have to pay them a bunch of money. Well, they're going to have to, that's taxable. It's not tax free. So I had a case, I had a many cases in San Francisco where we had to get rid of a tenant. We had to give them like 65000 Boy, did they get angry. Well, hey, you think it's tax free? Come on, you got 65 grand. You got to pay taxes on it. Okay. Daniel's got a question. I have a few. I have a few hundred dollars each year of foreign tax credit for index fund investment. 2022 was the first year amount was just above the minimum that required completing Formula 116. Okay, Formula 116 was a lot more complicated and convoluted than I anticipated. You betcha. And wasn't confident as I completed correctly, even though it was confident the final value I transferred back to Schedule 3 was correct. I guess the question is an audit risk and a form is not completely correct. Okay. All right, so Form 1116 is how you report your foreign tax credit. Now, if you're foreign, and I unfortunately don't have this memorized off the top of my head, I think if you're single, if it's 300 or less, you don't have to file Form 1116. If you're married, it's 600 or less. So if you're below those amounts, you elect out of filing Form 1116. What's the downside of doing that? If you have a, if you have a carryover because you couldn't use the whole amount, you'll lose it. But by filing the Form 1116, you get to take advantage of the carryover. But yeah, it's a complicated form because that's a whole that's a whole semester in tax school. Okay, all right, all right, okay, okay. So I think I think Jonathan, I think we hit all the questions here. Um, yeah, I think we hit all our questions here. So I think we're 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 great. Well, thank you for coming. I hope this was helpful. And the hard part was trying to pick which topics to cover. I mean, this was different than what we did last year. Last year, we had the winter storms. That was a big deal. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you so much again, Larry, for joining us today. And and thanks for everyone that joined us uh, from home and also um, for the folks who joined us from uh, the Bridge Learning Studio um, on the fifth floor of the main library. Um, Do you have happy... any questions from the Bridge? I don't know if we had any questions from the Bridge or not. Could you tell? Um, I didn't see anything in the chat. Um, so I, I'm guessing not. Okay. Um, Just want to make sure I don't miss anybody. Um, oh, oh, there we go. There they go. That was good. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Um, okay. Well, yeah. Thank you again, Larry. We really appreciate this. This was fantastic. Um, hope to have you back um, for more tax updates um, since, as you explained, this is constantly changing. Um, so, yeah, hopefully we'll see you again soon. And, and we saw the uh, the Corporate Transparency Act. And, um, and you know, Michael Finney of Channel 7 always does a tax calling show. So keep an eye on when he's going to do that again. I, I plan on volunteering for that again, too. That's always a lot of fun. Great. Thank you. All right. All right, everyone, have a great afternoon. And um, hopefully we'll see you at um, our next program. <laughs>